Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as we talk about the COVID-19 pandemic here in Erie County. It is another beautiful day here in Erie County, and I wish I had better news to report today. But unfortunately, today I have to report that we have 17 new positive cases of COVID-19 in Erie County. Yes, I said 17. One is in their 90s, two are in their 60s, one in their 50s, seven are in their 30s, two are in their 20s, two are in their teens, and two are under the age of five. As you can see, everyone of every age is susceptible. Our cases span from our very youngest children to someone in their 90s. Some are related to positives and others are not. So we must remember that regardless of the weather, regardless of what phase Erie County is in, regardless of how anxious we are to get back to the gatherings with friends and participating in our regular activities, this virus, COVID-19, continues to search for its next host. 14 of these new cases are located in zone one, one in zone two, two of the cases are in zone three, and you will find this information on the cumulative cases map by zone at eriecountypa.gov. So this number takes us to 162 cumulative cases here in Erie County of positive COVID-19, and now we have 121 recovered cases. The state numbers have not been reported as of yet today. 52% of the total cases in Erie County are female and 48% are male. And the breakdown by age, which I do on every Wednesday, is 4% are between 0 and 4, 1% between 5 and 9, 5% between 10 and 18, 14% between 19 and 24, 40% between 25 and 49, 25% between 50 and 64, and 11% are ages 65 and above. Regarding race and ethnicity of our total cases, we have 65% who are white, 23% African American or black residents, 10% are Asian residents, and 1% are multiracial. Contact tracing by the Erie County Department of Health, as you can imagine, is very, very busy right now with all of these cases to follow and uh, they continue uh, to do a phenomenal job. And I just, again, want to thank all those who have worked tirelessly since our first case uh, in mid-March to follow all of these positive cases and to get people isolated and quarantined. So fortunately, we have identified some new contact tracers from our recent applications, and we thank those who have applied. And the first will begin on June, on June 1st, which is coming up shortly. Uh, the health department, though, is still accepting applications. So if you are interested uh, and are qualified for these positions, you can look at the application process at careers.eriecountypa.gov. That's careers.eriecountypa.gov. I'd like to address uh, the COVID positive case of an employee who works at Elmwood Gardens Retirement Community. That facility is following all of the guidance from the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and it is testing all its employees, as well as its residents. And we commend them for handling this situation properly and quickly and doing all they can to keep their employees and their residents safe. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services highly recommend this type of expanded testing. Everyone, please continue to keep your six foot distance from anyone who does not live in your home with you. Please continue to wear a mask when you are out of your home around other people, wash your hands frequently with soap for at least 20 seconds, sanitize your surfaces regularly. And if we all continue to do these things, we will help to truly mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in our community. I wanna talk a little bit about our environmental team. They've received um, 1,692 complaints. They have made 214 field visits and they are assisting businesses with the guidance on how to operate safely during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. According to a report provided by our environmental team today, I am proud to share that overall, every zone in Erie County has seen an increase in mask wearing compliance. 
On May 19th, which was yesterday, the Erie County Department of Health staff conducted a surveillance at the same locations that they had surveilled on April 22nd. All zones saw an increase in the percentage of masks being worn by those going into and out of businesses, with the biggest difference occurring in Zone 5, which had a 5.91, almost a 6% increase in compliance. And Zone 4 was at 100% compliance with mask wearing during that surveillance yesterday. Overall, the mask compliance rate increased by 0.99%, and it was also noted that many stores are now refusing to allow customers to enter unless they're wearing a mask. They noticed many people going to a store, going back to their vehicle, getting their mask before they were allowed to enter. So thank you to all of our businesses and our residents who are working diligently to follow the guidelines for safe, safe operations. And that brings me to today's star player, a model business who's doing things well in light of COVID-19. Mama Mia's boutique in the West Area Plaza remains closed through June 1st, but they have provided countless deliveries to the doorsteps of Erie residents through their online ordering system. And we thank them for being um, a, certainly a great partner in this fight against COVID-19. Thank you to all our star players and all our businesses for helping us reopen Erie County while keeping our residents safe. And now I'd like to welcome today with me, Dr. Howard Nadwerney. I'm very um, thankful that he came on today. He is an infectious disease physician. He also has been consulting with us uh, throughout this pandemic with the Erie County Department of Health. And so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Howard Nad Nadwerney. Dr. Nadwerney. Good afternoon. Kathy asked me to come and talk about what we know about the spread of COVID-19 to help inform what we've done and what we're hoping to do to reduce the spread in the community. And I apologize if it's basic, but it's very helpful to start at the beginning <clears throat> and explain things in a logical way. This is a respiratory virus and it is spread primarily from person to person by people inhaling or having contact with virus particles. As with all viruses, you need to have a certain amount of virus that gets into your system before you get infected. And you can get exposed to COVID by a number of mechanisms. The ones we think of most are sneezing and coughing. Sneezing expels a huge cloud of particles that actually can travel at about 50 miles an hour for a brief time. And coughing expels somewhat less, but still a large amount. You can also spread this virus by talking, particularly talking loudly, singing. And singing is sort of a double whammy because not only are you expelling particles into the air long distances, but when you sing, you also take deep breaths. So you are also inhaling those particles deep into your lungs. But it turns out that even breathing and even speaking softly will spread some virus particles just because they're in your respiratory tract and they're spreading. Now, each of these mechanisms spreads different amount of viruses, which basically travel in fluid particles. The most important ones are droplets, and there are big droplets and small droplets. The big ones don't travel as far. The small ones travel somewhat farther. There are also very small particles, which we call aerosols, that travel farther distances, but contain much less virus. Based on reviews of outbreaks and these super spreader events where many people got sick, and clusters of infections, it is clear that you need to get a certain amount of virus to get sick. And the way you get that is either that you get exposed to a large number of virus particles at once, like someone sneezing on you, or you get exposed to a smaller amount of virus over a longer time. So for example, chorus practices or funerals or even at home, which is one of the most common places that people get infected because you're not getting exposed to a lot of virus at any one time, but over an hour or two or a day, you're getting exposed to many more. And so 
this is the major way that the virus spreads. And because of that, it tells you how people are getting sick as well as what we can do to reduce it. For example, even though the virus is found on surfaces, and there have been a number of experimental studies showing that you can identify the virus on almost any surface, in order to get infected, you actually need to get it into your nose and eyes or mouth. And so you're going to do that by picking it up from a surface with your hands and then touching your nose and eyes. But you also have to pick up enough virus over a short enough period of time to have a risk of getting infected. And from the studies, it's clear that the amount of virus on surfaces decreases fairly quickly so that surfaces are not the primary way people get infected. In addition, if you wash your hands or use alcohol hand sanitizer, then you're going to prevent yourself from getting infected because once you sanitize your hands, you're not going to bring any virus to your eyes, face, or nose. And that's another reason why we recommend people not touch their face and why they clean their hands very frequently when they're touching surfaces, especially when they're out of the house. At home, the major risk, even if surfaces are infected, is from the person in your home who has COVID. And so you're more likely to get it just from being near that person. And so when we have seen outbreaks of COVID, we have seen them in churches with choir practices. We've seen them at weddings and funerals and birthdays and bar mitzvahs and um, conferences and businesses and factories where workers work very close together. And we've seen them especially in home settings. And that's why social distancing and closing businesses down and wearing masks has made a major difference here. Because if you wear a mask, especially for those who are infected, you prevent the virus from traveling very far and you reduce the amount of virus that gets out. If you spend time away from people, then the heavy particles that contain the most virus are less likely to reach you. And if you don't spend a lot of time in close proximity to other people, then there's less opportunity to pick up enough virus to get infected. So that's why what's been put in practice has made a big difference. Now, as we reopen, that's why we need to be very careful because as people spend more time close together, they're more likely to expose each other to the virus. If they don't wear masks, if they are hanging out at bars, if they are working in a company close together, those factors all increase the risk of getting infected. And so it's a challenge, but we know that these methods work. And so the challenge is try to, trying to incorporate those into reopening businesses and increasing people's ability to get outside. So I think that at this point, I'll stop and see if there are any questions, because it's probably easier to answer questions than to try to guess what they will be. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nadwerny. Uh, very, great explanation, and I think people probably really appreciate that today. And we will start with questions, and we will start today with Erie News Now. Do you have questions for either one of us? Good afternoon, I do. Um, just your reaction, County Executive, to hearing 17 cases today. Uh, so your gut reaction when you heard that, and then any clue on possible causes for this uh, rather large spike? Well, we are about uh, 12 days into the yellow phase, and so we uh, think that the spike probably has a lot to do with that, with uh, the stay-at-home order being ended and people being out and about, and this would be about the time frame that we knew we would see some higher numbers, and of course we saw uh, 13 the other day, and now it's 17 today. So 17 today in one day, though, is a, a large number for us here in Erie County, and um, obviously something that we don't want to see uh, very often, and we hope that our numbers stay lower than that. But it is a concern, as it should be for everybody. Uh, Jet TV. Yeah, hi, Kathy. It's Samir. So looking at the numbers, 25 to 49, that's 40% of Erie County's cases. So I guess, why do you think this age group uh, had the highest numbers? 
Well, 25, to, it was interesting because I was looking at that myself um, and that group being so high. Um, and I'm not really sure why, except that they could be uh, individuals who just don't see, don't think that this is really going to affect them. You know, in the beginning, a lot of talk around the elderly, around those who have health problems um, being the most vulnerable, especially when it comes to the worst case scenario and, and the deaths that we've seen across uh, not only our state, our country, but the globe. But uh, so I think there could be maybe um, a relux reluctance to think that this is really something that affects them. May but that's the theory. I don't, we don't really have a full picture on why. And I don't know if Dr. Nadwerny has any other thoughts on that. I would actually agree with Kathy. I think that this is the age group that is more likely, especially in Erie, to think that it doesn't affect them. They are more likely to get less sick. They're working. They are very social. And if you are not careful, it's very easy to pick up this virus. This virus is very contagious and it thrives on close contact. And I think that as people have spent more time with each other and both families and extended families and socializing at work, I think the fact that we have done such a good job of keeping this from spreading rapidly has given people a false sense of security that it's not out there even though we know there are a lot more cases out there than we've been able to identify. Thank you, and a really quick follow-up. So of course, we're in the yellow phase 12 days now, and uh, we've talked on these conferences and we've stated that, uh, or you've stated that you've expected to see an increase in numbers, but I guess, should we get used to seeing double digit numbers, I guess, with these new cases, or do you think Erie is kind of seeing uh, spikes every day, higher than uh, what's anticipated? I can answer that. Thank you. I don't want us to get used to double digit increases. That's why the health department is hiring more contact tracers. People can spread this before they really know they're sick. So the challenge in keeping it from spreading is to identify cases and their contacts very rapidly and quarantine the contacts and the cases so that it doesn't keep spreading exponentially to many more. I wouldn't be surprised that we'll see double digit increases, but what I'm hoping is that it is more episodic rather than routine. The problem is that right, but re finding the cases doesn't stop the spread. It's people using appropriate social distancing and especially using masks that's gonna make the most difference. I guess looking at that realistically though, how, like what's our curve looking like in Erie? It seems like we're kind of on an uptick. Well, we are on an uptick, and I was, would have expected that as we reopen, since closure is a dramatic effect, and we are liberalizing that. It's not surprising that we see more cases. What we're really hoping is that the increase in cases is not explosive, and that it can be limited in how far it reaches across the county. Thank you. Erie Times News. Yes, Kathy. First, a uh, quick question on the numbers. You, you didn't, I don't believe I heard you list the negative test. Um, do you have a number for an updated number for that? Uh, we don't because we get that negative test number normally from the state. And the state, for some reason, right. has not updated their site and their numbers and uh, even haven't sent new numbers to us. And that's normally where we get our, our negative numbers from. Okay. And then um, you had mentioned that some of the cases, some of the 17 cases are um, related to earlier cases. Are there any clusters in this? Have, you, have, have the folks at the health department been able to trace this to certain particular gatherings or events or workplaces? You know, there's a, a variety of things. There's, there's some um, connections with families, of course, and we know people got, get together with their families. And, and so there's no specific cluster, but you know, there are definite connections and then there's others that we can't connect. And, um, you know, it's, it's really kind of across the board in terms of where these cases uh, that are positive and connected to a known positive, how they got that. And again, 14 of them were zone one, which is the city of Erie, correct? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure, talk Erie. Yes, good afternoon, Kathy, it's Joel Natale. I have a question for Dr. Ned Warney. Um, I wanted to ask about hospitalizations versus those that are convalescing at home. 
in other in other parts of the state, we've seen a lot more hospitalization than here. We have not got anywhere near uh, our utilization rate as far as our ICU beds, ventilators, and so on. Can you speak to that and explain? Is it because we have younger cases that people aren't getting that much sick? Just uh, uh, unpack that for me, if you would. I think that what happened is that we closed the county down before we had a lot of cases. And because of most people following the guidelines of staying at home and wearing masks when they went out and having less social contact, it didn't spread all that fast. And the people who are at highest risk, which are the elderly and the chronically ill, paid very close attention to those guidelines and have basically kept themselves away from the people who are less compliant and more likely to spread it, which are the younger people. So I think that it's spreading, particularly in groups and, and homes of younger people, and the people who are at higher risk have actually, in a sense, segregated themselves from being at high risk because our numbers are low. When you have a lot of cases in a community, it's basically impossible to segregate yourself from risk. But when the number of cases is lower, it actually is possible. We've also been fortunate that it has not spread dramatically to the nursing homes here, which are the groups that tend to die at the fastest rate. So I think we've been very fortunate because we got involved early and really changed the whole dynamic of this before it had a chance to explode. Just a quick follow-up. I'm getting questions at the radio station about masks and that masks can sometimes have uh, a, have the user breathing in less oxygen because you're breathing in your own air, your own carbon dioxide uh, exhaust. Uh, can you talk about that? Um, yeah, that's not true. Um, when you breathe in and out, the air is getting through the mask and around the mask, especially when you breathe out, because when you breathe out, that positive pressure is stretching the mask so that the air that goes out gets replaced by regular air coming in. There's no evidence that oxygen levels fall when you wear a mask. Um, if it did, I can tell you there'd be a lot of people at the hospital collapsing and they don't. Appreciate that. Thank you. Erie News. No, it's not, an, it's not an excuse to avoid wearing a mask. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Nadwerni. And Erie News Now. Hi, I'm not sure who would be best to address this, so uh, I'll toss it out there, and whoever is the person to address it, if you would, please. Um, can you talk about what sort of a strain this is putting on our contact tracers between, uh, you know, finding out 13 on Monday and then 17 today? Um, you know, new hires coming, but uh, until they arrive, just talk about what sort of a strain this is putting on them. Well, I'll speak first, but I know Dr. Nadwerny uh, spends a lot of time on phone calls with our contact tracers, so he might have something more to add. But I will say that these individuals have been working tirelessly, tirelessly since that first case on March 18th. Um, we try to get a, uh, when we have a positive, we try to get that assigned to one of our contact tracers within an hour and that they would have contact with that person within 24 hours, the sooner the better, and that then, you know, within the next 24 hours, we're, we're reaching out to their contacts and getting those people uh, quarantined. So as we've talked many times, it's a very complicated and intense um, job, especially with some of our positives who have more contacts. But um, they've been doing a great job, but we do obviously need to get those other people in there and give them some relief. And especially when you see the numbers right now, we have 41 active cases. And so they've got a lot of work um, in front of them at the moment, and, and I really commend them. I don't know, Dr. Nadwerny, if you want to say anything further about uh, that. I would say this kind of surge today would pretty much max out their ability to do case tracking. And since they've set a goal of rapid identification of contacts and getting them quarantined, which is critical to keeping it from spreading, um, I worry that if it continues to go up at this rate, they won't be able to keep the tracing that they've been doing. And that worries me because it makes a difference. 
And, Doctor, if I may, please, would you just give me the, the quick hit there on, uh, and I know you've addressed it earlier, but, you know, I'm just looking for something quick here on, in layman's terms, the reason why them being even slowed down a little bit is so detrimental. The people who have been exposed to the identified case, so one person is infected and is reported to the health department, that person has potentially exposed several other people, household members, people they work with, people they're in close contact with. Those people also could be incubating it and starting to get sick. So they could potentially spread it to other people over the next several days. If you identify them right away, then you can keep them from spreading it as they become symptomatic because the virus is contagious a couple of days before the illness shows up. So the faster you can isolate people, the less likely those secondary cases are to infect more people. Thank you. Jet TV. Yes, hi, Kathy Samir. So uh, circling back around to the numbers, so we have two cases out of these 17 that are under five. Are they tied to a daycare or anything like that? Do you know? I don't have any details on the young children. Okay. And then are any of the cases uh, tied to any contact with the Corey Bakery? I don't have any information on that either. Um, so I can't, uh, can't say yes or no to that. But I'm, 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 I'm thinking about the zones, and I don't think there was anyone from Zone 4 that I mentioned. So, And that would be a Zone 4, but that doesn't mean there aren't people who live in other zones who wouldn't go to the bakery. So just saying. Uh, right, yeah, that's why I mentioned it, because it's Zone 1. But I mean, easily they could have traveled to Corey. But all right, think. Sure. Erie Times News. Yes, Kathy. Um, the Harbor Creek supervisors earlier today um, approved a resolution calling for the county to open all businesses. Wanted to get your reaction to that. It's not up to the county. Uh, the order is by the state, the governor, and so um, we're waiting for the governor's uh, plan to open the rest of the businesses, uh, which would be, um, I would assume, under the green phase, but again, we haven't seen anything about that. So uh, we will wait for the governor. We are following the guidelines from those who are most knowledgeable and have the science and the data behind uh, our opening to decide when it is safest to do that. Um, and then just a couple of the, the questions I usually ask. One, have you had any word, or has Dr. Nadwerney heard of any of the kids having the inflammatory syndrome um, that we've heard about in other areas? I have not heard of any of that, I, uh, that syndrome, Dr. Nadwerney. No, I haven't heard of that in Erie yet either. Okay. And I know the state has been slow to release its information today. Has there been anything new on this, this fourth case that the state has lists us as having? We have no new information. Death. No, we have no new information on that. What I did get some knowledge about is that the two systems, the one that records deaths and the NED system that we use, um, they are different systems and they don't actually overlap. So it is going to maybe be some time before the state can reconcile the uh, data between the two different data sets. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Talk Erie. Yes, uh, Kathy, I wanted to ask you about the racial breakout. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to make sure I have these numbers right. You said 23% are African American, correct? Let me get back to my paper here where I have those. Thank you. 65% uh, are white, 23% African American or black. Uh, and 10% are Asian. Yes. So are we seeing an outbreak in new American, uh, ne Nepalese, Bhutanese? Uh, what, what, and what, do you, what are your comments about that? So what we're seeing is a large number within the urban core. Um, and you know, we did talk a little bit about the CMU database that they were using. And, and one of the risks for COVID-19 is living in an urban setting because people live closer together. And again, as Dr. Nadwerny said, the most common way that this is being spread is person to person. 
And so that's why you've seen outbreaks across the country have all been pretty much in an urban center unless there was one specific event that people were around together. So that's what we're seeing in um, our community too. And that's why we're looking, and I've talked a little bit about this, about getting out and doing more testing in some of these urban neighborhoods to try to, to, try to find more of the positive cases to Dr. Nadworny's point so that we can then uh, get everyone quarantined that needs to be quarantined and, and slow down the spread. But do you get a sense that maybe some of the, uh, the new Americans or, the, or maybe the English as second language learners are not getting the message of, uh, of the mitigation? We've worked really hard uh, in terms of creating the right uh, messaging by having many things translated, uh, getting those out. We've talked about how we just last weekend, there was a drop of uh, the door hangers and some other information to some of these neighborhoods um, because not everybody's watching me at three o'clock, we know that. And there are others who maybe aren't on social media. And so trying to reach out to all of these different entities who may not be seeing the information as much as others are is really, really important. And it's something we've been working on uh, almost since the beginning. So um, there was a door hanger that we put in um, a couple of different neighborhoods within the city of Erie last weekend. I don't say we, it was done by um, some volunteers and other groups were, that were working with our partners. And um, what was really interesting, but really great, is we got a lot of phone calls into the Department of Health. And we didn't get those questions via an email or social media. We got them by an actual phone call, which tells us that there are a number of people who maybe don't have access to the internet and uh, need us to reach out to them in other ways. So that was one way we did, we, it was successful, and we wanna keep on doing that and trying to reach all these different pockets of our populations to make sure everyone gets the messages. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Erie News Now, do you have any final question? I do, for both you and the doctor. Um, does the pleasant weather we're having, it, it tends to encourage people to get out even more, instill any more fears, any more concerns in either of you? I'm going to have Dr. Nad, where you take that first. Well, certainly being outside is not considered a high risk because the air dilutes virus and spreads it around. But if someone is close to someone else and doesn't have a mask on, the fact that there's all this air around you doesn't prevent me from infecting you if we spend any time close together. So being outside and socially distancing is probably very, very low risk for spreading COVID. But having been outside, I can tell you that when I go walking and I see people talking to each other, trying to be six feet away, it doesn't take very long because they're about two feet away so they can hear each other. So I think the concern I would have is that if you're outside using appropriate social distancing, then you're probably okay but if you're close proximity, you're sitting around a little campfire with every chair next to every other chair, being outside isn't going to protect you from getting infected. So people need to be diligent and they need to understand where the risks are, um, whether they're indoors or outdoors. Certainly indoors is a higher risk, but outdoors is not without risk, it's just less if you do it right. And I guess my answer would be pretty much the same. You know, let's, let's continue to follow the guidelines. Let's stay six feet away. Let's wear our masks when we are outside and we are with our neighbors, our friends, whoever we might come across while we are out there. Uh, Jet TV, do you have any final question? I do not, thanks. Mm -hmm. Erie Times News. David? Yes, Kathy, I want to talk a little bit about um, the upcoming primary. Um, and I don't know if you've talked much with, with Doug about this, but what kind of precautions um, will there will be in place that day to help protect folks who, who go out to vote? So um, actually, Doug Smith and I from the elections office and the county council office just spoke, um, I think, day before yesterday. And um, he was reaching out to the um, environmental team at the health department with his plan and just to get any tweaking done to that plan that they feel would be added uh, in terms of the safety. Of course, the six foot distancing as people come in to vote, the cleaning of the pens of the machines uh, with sanitizer that people would be touching, uh, making sure that uh, everyone who comes in has a mask on, 
keeping um, those poll workers six feet apart from each other because they sit there all day pretty much together. And so all of those things um, will be in place. And uh, I know he and his team are working diligently to make sure that they can do everything safely. I know we have um, a little less than 8,000 of the ballots back in of the approximately 30,000 that have been um, requested for mail-in ballots. I also uh, want to remind everybody that the courthouse is open today until 4.30, tomorrow, Friday, and Tuesday. So if you haven't got your mail-in ballot and you don't want to ask for it, you can actually just go to the courthouse, apply for a mail-in ballot, and actually fill out your ballot right then and there and vote. So you can vote early um, in the next few days at the courthouse. And so there are options, but I know uh, Doug Smith and his entire team, Tanya, and, and uh, the uh, members of the election board are working hard to make sure that voting is as safe as possible, and we obviously encourage everyone to get out on June 2nd. Do you expect there's going to be a lot fewer polling places? Uh, the or polling places the I don't think go. are going to change. I think the polling places are going to stay the same in terms of the numbers. Um, I know we've had some issues with poll workers who don't want to come in that day. Um, as you know, it's a one day or twice, twice a year job. And um, many of those people are older and retired. And so there are a number who have made the decision, probably rightfully so, that it's too risky for them to go and be a poll worker and have all that contact with all of those people. So, um, you know, I know uh, Doug Smith has still been looking for some poll workers. And, uh, but hopefully if more and more people do the mail-in ballot, then there'll be fewer people at the polls, which will make everyone safer. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Talk, Erie, do you have any final questions? Just, just one last one for the doctor. It, have you seen in the data as you're doing uh, the investigation what the typical infection uh, symptoms and recovery rate is? Is it a 14-day? Is it 21 days? I'm hearing people that were sick for a month, a month plus. Is there an average that you guys have identified? I haven't been so directly involved that I could give you an answer, but my impression is that the majority of people are mildly ill and recover in terms of feeling well within a week or 10 days. There are clearly people in Erie who are having persistent symptoms of cough or fatigue or respiratory issues that are lasting multiple weeks. So they haven't felt like they fully recovered even many weeks later. So we're seeing a wide range, but I think the majority of people are recovering quite quickly and have mild illnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And thank, and thank you, Dr. Nadwerney, uh, not only for coming in with me today, but really being a constant source of knowledge and insight and clarification for all of us uh, in Erie County and particularly at the Erie County Department of Health. You've been um, just wonderful over all these weeks in uh, consulting with us. And now before we finish, it's time for your weekly reminder to please complete the 2020 census. The response numbers for this week are 68% of households throughout all of Erie County and directly within the city of Erie, 59%. So we still have a fair amount of work to do, folks. So please remember that um, the census is important. It has a lot to do with the funds that come into our community at this time of a pandemic. The funds that come in to help us cover the costs um, are really based on census numbers. So uh, your schools, the roads, all sorts of things, $2,100 per person that we don't count is money that we don't get each year over 10 years for the next uh, decade. So I hope that everyone understands the importance of the census. Please, if you haven't filled it out, please do that. Tell your friends, your neighbors, your family members how important it is. Go to uh, 2020census, oh, I'm sorry, my, my, 2020census.gov and you can fill your census form out there or you can call on your phone if you don't want to do it online or you don't have a computer. And you can do that at 844-330-2020. That's 844-330-2020. And so thank you again for being with me and we will be back tomorrow. And in the meantime, please again, stay as close to home as you can. Please stay safe, wear a mask while you're out and always stay calm. Thank you.